know, there's, there's a saying that someone put in a song recently that you can't make old friends. And you know that, that sense and that understanding that you either are old friends or you're not. And there are relationships that God brings into your life in your early years. And by God's grace, he preserves those relationships past 10 years, past 20 years, some past 30 years. And you can look at the seasons of your life, and yet there's these fixed anchor points. And two families have been like that in our lives. One is the Hoffmans, the other is the Harrells. And you get both of them. So I'm jealous and uh, actually incredibly humbled to even be here this morning. As Dave mentioned, the Hoffmans have been part of our life um, since our days back at Grace Church in Southern California. And just to see you leading worship here and a part of this is, is like a flashback of all kinds of memories. So, and then, of course, uh, his son Zach and family spent some time with us in Louisville and we adopted them in and we miss all their kids and just the whole Hoffman crew is extensive, as you know. And then the Heralds, I met Dave Harrell, your pastor, when I was about 17 or 18 years old as a young kid trying to figure out what God wanted me to do at the Master's College. And I walk into class and I see this guy wearing cowboy boots teaching biblical counseling. I thought, he does not fit. What is he doing in Southern California? And he looked at my boots and probably said the same thing. So we were the two guys on campus that I knew wore cowboy boots regularly. Then I meet his son, Joseph, and we were probably the only two skilled marksmen that were students at the Master's College at the time. And had they had a rifle team, we probably would have owned that, but uh, we didn't. So they didn't, so we just had to make it up as we went. And then I recently had the opportunity to hear from uh, Dave's father, Edgar, when he came to Southern and gave his story of his experience at an event we do there for our veterans. So... All that to say, uh, we feel like we're home in some way, just to know those two families, and we know that they're a small reflection of, of all of your love for Christ, your love for the Word, your love for this church and what God is doing, and it's just a thrill to actually look you in the eye and, and see what has fueled Dave as he has told me so many times about you all. Well, if you have your copy of God's Word, please open it to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. Now, as I mentioned to you a little bit ago, uh, we're from Southern California. That's home. That's where I met my wife, Skye. Our daughters were born, and, and we just kind of grew up in Southern California, and that was life. But a few years uh, after, or a few years after we got married, we had the opportunity to move to Southern Alabama and live there for a little while, then went to Florida, were there for a while, and then to Kentucky. And so after leaving California, we spent a lot of time, still spent a lot of time in the South, and we got real familiar with what the term Southern hospitality means. What it means when you have a home that's open and visiting is part of your life and someone dropping by is no big deal. And, and so we went through our own assimilation process into that and have had a home that is just like that. And we're thrilled for it. But everyone has that friend. That friend who can suddenly invite themselves over and has no sense of when to leave. Do you know what I mean? That friend who... You see them in public, and at first you think, oh, rapture, 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 and then, oh, hi, great to see you. <laughs> what are you doing tonight? Oh, you're coming over for dinner. Oh, how wonderful. <laughs> Pretty soon the person's there, and you're trying to figure out how do I make them leave, and you're saying things like, well, let's pray before you leave, and uh, can I help you find your coat? And you've already vacuumed the carpet, and you've already put all the leftovers away and turned out the lights and tucked the kids in, and they're still there, and you're just left thinking, what do I do? There's all kinds of stories you could probably recall on that front, and maybe some of you are that friend, and we're all kind of learning how to get along. <laughs> but what we learn in, in Luke chapter 19 is one of the most amazing stories of a man who's living his life, puts himself in the pathway of the creator of the universe, and the only time in the Bible where God looks at a man and says, I'm coming to your house for dinner. Imagine that phone call home to tell your wife to get things ready because the one who created us is coming over for dinner. So Luke chapter 19, it says this, and he entered Jericho and was passing through and there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and he was rich. Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was and was unable because of the crowd for he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree in order to see him, for he was about to pass through that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. 
And he hurried and came down and received him gladly. When they saw it, they all began to grumble, saying, He has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. The text brings up the identity of the person here known as Zacchaeus, but it brings it up by his occupation. He's a tax collector. And not just a tax collector, but he's at the top of the pyramid scheme. He's the chief tax collector. And under him are all the regular tax collectors. Now, if you recall that word from Scripture, you know that the Bible is no friend of tax collectors. In fact, of all the corrupt professions that are known at the time, God, for one reason or another, highlights this one over and over again. In fact, it says in Matthew chapter 9, verse 11, Jesus saw a man called Matthew sitting in the tax collector's booth and said to him, follow me, and he got up and followed him. One of the first tax collectors we meet who's caught up in this whole corrupt system of taking more than what was rightfully owed to the government and pocketing it is a man named Matthew. Jesus is showing that he can save and transform anybody, but tax collectors were some of the most offensive people on the face of the planet. In fact, they were the person that no matter what your religious affiliation was, what your background was, what your economic status was, when you saw a tax collector, you saw a repulsive, vile person whose only objective was to separate you from as much of your money as possible. Tax collectors were no friends. In fact, when Jesus wants to tell the church how to treat somebody who's entrenched in unrepentant sin listen to what he says in matthew 18 verse 17 if the person you're confronting refuses to listen to you tell it to the church and if he refuses to listen even to the church let him be to you as a gentile and a what a tax collector I mean, this is one of those occupations where nothing about it is healthy. Nothing about it is admirable. Nothing about it is affirmed. Jesus is saying that the tax collectors are so corrupt that their sin is synonymous with their title. This is a pretty bad occupation. Some tax collectors understood, though, that they were sinful. And they needed to be helped. Earlier in Luke chapter 15, it's verse 1, it says, Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near him to listen to him. They wanted to hear. They wanted to listen. Some tax collectors knew that there was sin in their life and needed help. And they were willing to even go to the extravagant step of exposing themselves to a public crowd, putting themselves potentially in harm's way because of the retaliation of others to just hear what Christ might have to say. And some did repent and were saved. Luke chapter 3 says that some tax collectors came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And Jesus' response is, collect no more than what you should collect. Just do your job. Do it with integrity. Do it honestly. Speak what you're told to collect and don't collect any more than that. So over and over again, there's this affirmation that tax collectors were a horrific group of people, but there's only one group that's worse than them. And that group is also in this text. It's the Pharisees. The Pharisees were even worse than the tax collectors. In fact, Jesus was in a debate with a Pharisee in Matthew chapter 21, verse 31. He says, truly I say to you that the tax collectors and the prostitutes will get into heaven, into the kingdom of God before you. I mean, just when you thought you hit the bottom, the worst group of society at the tax collectors, Jesus says, no, there's a cellar underneath that, and that's where all the Pharisees are. Jesus is saying it's easier for tax collectors and prostitutes to get into the kingdom of God than it will be for the Pharisee. You say, who's the Pharisee? Pharisees are the religious elite. 
They're the ones who perceive themselves to have nothing wrong. Because externally, they kept the letter of the law. They obeyed everything that they believed in the interpretation they had of what God commanded. They did everything they thought they could do to be religious. And Jesus is saying, no. There's tax collectors, and then the only thing that has a stench worse than them are the Pharisees. And so you have this combination of the most offensive religious hypocrites and the most offensive extortionists brought together in one passage. And so we jump into it. Now, if you back up just to get context, in Luke chapter 18, Jesus has raised Lazarus from the dead. He's moving with the crowds towards Jerusalem. And so as he's healing, as he's teaching the gospel, as he's saving sinners, the crowds are around him in this massive tsunami that's moving towards Jerusalem. And so with him are a crowd of people that have already heard some elements of the gospel presentation. They've seen his miraculous power in action. They've heard of his previous miracles. They've seen all of the activities of Christ as he's been walking with them day after day. And as this group passes through Jericho in the region there, Luke 18 says that he has conversations with other people. In fact, in Luke 18, verse 18, we meet a rich, young ruler. And then in chapter 19, we meet a rich, short tax collector. Jesus is doing a lot to describe the identities of people he's interacting with here. But it says that he walks through Jericho, and that city may come to your mind from the stories of Joshua, when Joshua led the children of Israel into the promised land, and the first place they assaulted was Jericho. Jericho, if you remember, is like the Fort Knox of all of Canaan. It's the most impregnable place where they thought, if this place can stand against any attack, then we're safe throughout the rest of the kingdom. And yet God in his providence led Israel to win that battle by faith. The walls crumbled, the city was annihilated, and the door was opened to take over all of Canaan. So this is a city with a tremendous history A tremendous history that now is involved in explaining the gospel to Zacchaeus. Verse 3 of chapter 19 tells us that there's a crowd that's assembled. That there's a group of people that heard that Jesus was coming along. And if you can think in your mind that they had lined the streets and pressed in. This is so different than the way that society works today. Because in our culture today, when there's a famous person, there's usually barricades and bodyguards and all kinds of distance that we keep. And even in our our own mindset, we have this spatial proximity. If you notice, look around the room, there's a lot of chairs in between people because we have this etiquette where no matter if we could sit next to somebody, we we take a seat apart, right? That's how we work. If there's two cars parked next to each other and a space open between all those, you'll just park an extra space over because that's how we do things. We like our space. But that's not in the mindset of anyone in Luke chapter 19. In fact, when there's a famous person, they're looking to come right up and touch them. That would freak people out today. Couldn't handle that. That's not the way we think or work. We need that distance. But not in Luke chapter 19. In fact, this crowd is pressing in. There's no sticks that you can put your your phone on so you can put it up high and get a a view like that with any kind of a device or tool. There's no drone you can fly in to see Jesus. You have to find some way to see him because the crowd is pressing in all around him. Such a different culture. And in the middle of that crowd is a man named Zacchaeus, as verse 2 says, who shows up. Now Zacchaeus, in your mind, depending upon your church background, you might be trying to get that song out of your head right now. I knew that song was in your head, right? Let's get out of the way. Zacchaeus was a what? Wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. He wanted to see if he passed that way. He looked up in the tree, and he said... For I'm going to your house today, and it says it over and over again, right? Okay, we got it out of the way, all right? I'm glad to know who was in Sunday school in the 80s. That's good. Or 70s, or somewhere else in there. This is the way that the, the story unfolds. But this is a tax collector, and as I said, this is not somebody who's an elected official who's in charge of spending the money. This is somebody who's appointed to a position in order to collect the money. This person has powers to enforce the rules. They can, to some degree, make the rules and enforce the rules and penalize you for not keeping the rules that they made up. 
For Zacchaeus, even to be present in the crowd is a risk, risk to his own health. But he's there, driven by something he wants. Now, this is fascinating that God, of all the things that he could describe Zacchaeus by, chooses in verse 3 to say that he was small in stature. Now, that's not saying a whole lot about him. He was short. And there's nothing wrong with being short. God loves short people. But remember, it was Israel that chose Saul because of his height to be their leader. And that was a terrible choice. Stature says nothing about character, does it? But it's a critical element to know because what he does is dependent upon who he is. The step he takes, verse 4, says that he seen the pathway where Christ was walking, the direction which Christ was going in. He runs up ahead and he grabs hold of a sycamore tree and hoists himself up. That's a very undignified thing for a person to do. You would think that if he had any measure of recognition, the crowd would sort of part so he could step forward and put out his hand to greet Jesus. If he had any measure of honor given to him by those who were there, they would make a way for him to see Jesus. But in fact, the crowd may see him and intentionally edge him out because he's the most despised guy in the region. They are objecting to his desire to see Jesus. If you can think of the supernatural forces at work here, this man, for whatever reason, is driven to see Jesus the crowd wants to prevent that. The crowd is blocking him. So he runs ahead and does a very undignified thing. In the moment, he's forgetting his title, forgetting his position, forgetting who he represents, leaving aside every aspect of his own dignity. He's a man on a mission. His intent is not to force a conversation. In fact, all it says is he just wanted to see him. He just wanted to put eyes on him. He just wanted to look Jesus in the eye because there was something already working in Zacchaeus that said, I don't have the answer. I know what the problem is. And I don't know how to fix it. There's something already going on that God and his spirit's power is working in Zacchaeus that drives him to say there's a problem. And I don't know the answer, but I know that man does. That man has the answer. And I'm going to put myself in a place to at least see him. And look him in the eye. There's a driving force there to just catch a glimpse of the Savior. That tells us something. We need to catch that. Zacchaeus was doing a lot to put himself in the way of truth. It's similar to when, on a health side of things, when you have a cough that you don't understand, or you feel a pain in your chest you don't understand, and you go to the doctor immediately because there's something not right. You don't know the answer, but you know there's a problem. And without even having a clue of where this is going to end up, you go and you just say, I've got a problem. That's basically what Zacchaeus is doing. Well, the drama continues as Jesus is moving forward. Zacchaeus is positioning himself in a tree, looking down over the pathway. And you can imagine there's probably some people heckling him or looking up at him and saying, look at the guy in the tree. What in the world? And you think that's, if you think that's embarrassing, wait to see what's about to happen. Verse 5. Jesus came to the place, and he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. We don't have a category for the shock that that comment, that statement puts in the minds of everybody who can hear it, including Zacchaeus. I mean, this, there is no explanation for why Jesus would want to do this on a human level. Who would want to go associate with the most despised person in town? Oh, and by the way, Jesus shows a little bit of his omniscience because Zacchaeus was probably not wearing a name tag. And no one probably announced that it was Zacchaeus up there. This is Jesus just walking up, addressing him by name, saying, come down because I'm staying with you. Jesus is saying, I'm on a mission. I'm here to save sinners. And I'm going to find a sinner today to save. And I'm going to do it by going to your house. This was said in public. Everyone heard what Jesus was saying. There's no hiding. There's no masking his invitation. No private connection. He's just overtly telling everybody, including the Pharisees who are standing there scoffing at him, that he's going to go to the home 
of one of the most despised people. Of course, Zacchaeus hurries down. Verse 6 that says that he hurries down and came down and received him gladly. Received him gladly. There's a warmth, there's an excitement, there's an energy about Zacchaeus because whatever it is that compelled him to that moment to take this step, to get in front of Jesus, whatever it was that was driving him has now resulted in, a, in not just an invitation of, of Jesus, would you come over to my house? This was saying from the Creator, I'm coming to your place. But watch what happens. You would think there'd be somewhat of a shock of, oh, wow, lucky him. Oh, how exciting. I wish, I wish we could be there too. But when they saw it, verse 7, they all began to grumble saying, he has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. There's disdain in his voice. There's hatred in his voice. There's anger in those voices. There's shock. They're appalled by it. How can this man want to go be with sinners? In fact, if we go back to Matthew chapter 10, verse 9, this takes us right back to the Pharisees' reaction when Matthew was called to be a follower of Christ. The Pharisees had no category for this. They could not understand why Jesus, a holy man, a righteous man, the acclaimed Savior, Son of God, why would he spend time with sinners? This is shocking. Look again, look down at verse 10. I'm sorry, look at, yeah, at verse 7, I'm sorry, I was glancing around here. He says, why would this man go to be the guest of someone who is a sinner? The disciples were asked by the Pharisees at one point, why is your teacher eating with tax collectors and sinners? Why is he associating with them? What you see over and over again throughout the ministry of Christ is that Jesus finds those who the world despises. The world that perceives themselves to be healthy, the world that perceives themselves to have no need of salvation and no need of Christ, no need of forgiveness, looks down on those who actually do know they need forgiveness, who actually do know that they need to be cleansed of sin. They may not understand any of the implications of that, but they know that there is a problem. That was the case when Jesus called Matthew to himself. That was the case here when Jesus calls Zacchaeus to himself. It's in Matthew chapter 9 where Jesus says it's not to the healthy, it's, it is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the self-righteous, but to call sinners. That's who Jesus calls to repentance, Matthew chapter 9 verse 12. The Pharisees stand back and slander Christ and they publicly attack him. They publicly accuse him. It's more than just a casual comment. It's not curiosity that's driving them, saying, why would he do this? It's indignation that's postured as a question. It's shock, saying, why would he do this? Who would dare do that? What's he thinking? You know, there are people like that today. They see Christians who work in a very secular environment, who go to great lengths to tell others about Christ and mock your efforts to do it. We have people today who can understand evangelism where somebody would actually go talk to sinners and associate and be known and even interact with sinners. But it was Jesus' method here and his constant message to those sinners and even to the Pharisees that he's going to associate with those who no one else will even talk to. He's going to go to those who are willing to say, there's a problem and I don't know how to solve it. He came to the, save those who are sinners and who know it. Here what we see is Zacchaeus begin to incriminate himself. There's something that you see in a person when they know that there's a problem. And it's that they begin to incriminate themselves. They begin to point out where their sin is and what they must be forgiven from. You see, Jesus didn't come to save those who prance around thinking that their works will make them righteous. That's the Pharisees. He didn't come to save those who walk around thinking that all their activity make them more pleasing to God. He didn't come to save those who in the moment are acting as if 
their sin goes away by simply feeling sorry over it. He says he came to seek and save the lost. And what he says here is those who are broken over their sin, those who mourn over their sin, those who know that there's a problem and reach out to him, he'll save them. There's a danger of self-deception that happens here. Zacchaeus is not deceived about who he is. He, at this point, realizes that he's a sinner. But it's the Pharisees who are deceived about their position and who they are. In fact, glance back at Luke chapter 18. Go back one chapter and look at this self-deception example that Christ gives. Luke chapter 18, verse 9, it says he tells this parable that some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others, others with contempt. That's exactly what's going on in the next chapter. You have those who believe in themselves, trust in their activities, trust in their own actions, their own methods of life, thinking that that makes them righteous. They view others with contempt. They look at Zacchaeus. They look at Jesus with contempt. And so Christ gives this parable. And verse 10 says, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself. Was, the Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. Now you pause there for a minute because that gives us a great understanding of who's in the next chapter. The Pharisees are the people who believe that. And you notice the prayer is not uttered to God, but it's uttered to himself. He's basically giving his resume in a way that everyone can hear this. He says, I'm not like other people. I'm not like swindlers. I'm not like the unjust. I'm not like the adulterers. And points basically at this tax collector says, I'm not like him. And I'm so different from them that I do fast and I do pay tithes and I do all these actions. That's the Pharisee. And the opposite of this Pharisee is who you meet in verse 13 of Luke 18. It says, but the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. You see again? It's the sinner that's incriminating himself. It's the sinner who's saying to God, I'm guilty. And yet it's the hypocrite, the Pharisee, the arrogant one who's saying to God, I'm innocent. It's the tax collector who says, I deserve the punishment. I've broken your law. I need your mercy. Mercy is what God does not give us that I deserve. And this is the tax collector saying, God, I know I deserve your punishment. I know I deserve your wrath. I know I deserve your condemnation. I know I deserve eternal hell. I know that I've broken your law. Don't give it to me, Lord. I'm a sinner, and I need to fall on you for your grace. And yet it's the Pharisee who goes to God and says, God, aren't I impressive? Have you seen my works lately? Look at my calendar. It's just full of sacrificial actions. Here's my bank statement. You can see everything I've given. My as well, here's my 990 for my 501c3. I want you to see everything that I'm giving away to everybody. I fast. Look at my calorie count. I mean, like, this is the person who is so excited about what they've done for God that all they can tell God is why God should be so honored to have them on his team. But look at verse 14. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. That's the tax collector. The tax collector is humbling himself, not with exaltation in mind, but humbling himself because he knows he's a sinner. He knows he is wicked. He knows he needs forgiveness. And yet that distinct crowd is still standing there Stuck in their sin, blinded by their pride, but awful proud of their actions. The question that comes to mind always in studying Luke 19 in this passage, in this contrast between the broken and the arrogant, between those who think they need no healing and those who know they need forgiveness. The 
question that comes to mind often is, in which category are we? Where do we stand? Do we stand with the sinner who beats his breast, the tax collector, and says, God, be merciful to me? Or do we stand with those who want to repeat back to God all the reasons why God should be so proud of them? It brings to mind the Sermon on the Mount where Christ is drawing a dividing line between those who are truly his followers and those who simply want to use God to obtain their own desires. It's in Matthew chapter 5 where you read the Beatitudes where Christ says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. No Pharisee is going to stand up and want to say those things describe my life because they don't want any of the pressure and any of the torment that goes with following Christ. They don't want the anger of the world vented against them. They don't want to deal with the realities of sin. They simply want to maintain an external facade that others can see when yet their heart is so far from God. So when Jesus looks at Zacchaeus in Luke chapter 19, he's overturning the religious establishment and saying, I'm not going to those who think they need nothing. I'm going to those who know they need everything. So look back now at the text and what happens in verse 8. Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I'll give to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I'll give back four times as much. You see what he's saying? Is that this stuff that I've accumulated, yes, I've got wealth. This stuff means nothing. This is not Zacchaeus trying to buy salvation or impress Jesus with all of his wealth. This is Zacchaeus saying, I want none of it. It means nothing to me. Half of what I have, I'll give to those in need. If I've defrauded anyone, I'll pay back exponential. I'll give them back four times as much. That's what flows out of a heart that knows it's been forgiven. When you've been given the eternally sustained gift of salvation, when you've been forgiven of your sin, when Jesus Christ says to you, you are declared righteous and takes to the cross the weight of our sin, the guilt of our sin, and gives us his righteousness, your immediate response is not only of gratitude, but of distance from the world. Your hands open and you release the things that once were your identity and say, I don't need it. I don't want it. There's no hope in that stuff anyway. There's no security in that stuff anyway. There's no joy or pleasure or lasting happiness in that stuff. Because I have a treasure, which is Jesus, that he's given to me. And that's all that I want. Zacchaeus is saying, I want to give to those in need because, God, you have given to me far more than I can ever understand. You fill me with your love. You've given me the forgiveness of sin. You've erased the debt that I owe. And a very simple, immediate reaction of that transformed heart, that repentant heart, is to release the treasures of this world and to let go. And Jesus says to him in verse 9, Today salvation has come to this house. He says, Zacchaeus, this home that was once the depository of all the stuff in the world that you could accumulate is now a home where salvation is made clear. Zacchaeus walks away that day, not just having looked the Savior in the eye, but have the Savior enter his heart. Zacchaeus walks away, not with more human physical wealth that he extorted from someone else. He walks away as a man who's broken in his sin, but forgiven in his heart. He walks away as a man who can look people in the eye and do his job as the chief tax collector in a way that's shocking to the world. 
you notice what Jesus does not say? He doesn't say resign and get an honorable profession. What Jesus is, in fact, doing is saying redeem the profession. Do it with integrity. Blow the mind of everyone around you by doing exactly what you're told to do and nothing more. Do the job in the most God-honoring way that the earth has ever seen and be the salt and light that God intends you to be in that work environment. What Zacchaeus wants to do is to make it right. To go back to those who he has sinned against and take the reproach away so that he can then look them in the eye and say, I want to tell you about Christ. There's something there that's a lesson to all of us who have a past. To the people that you've offended in the past. The people that you've defrauded in the past. And you recognize that that offense is still there blocking the gospel presentation that you would like to communicate to them. What Zacchaeus does by model is an example for us to follow. To say, hey, if there's a way that I can go back and remove that sin that I've done against someone else, to make it right, ask forgiveness, make restitution, in some way so that the gospel will be heard by them. And when they see my life, they'll see someone who's been transformed by the gospel. Do it. Well, the section ends with verse 10, as Christ says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's the whole moral in the life of Christ. Why did Jesus leave heaven? Why did he come to earth? Why did he take on the form of human flesh? Why did he set aside the full expression of his attributes and all the harmony and unity of the Trinity in heaven? Why did he enter into his own creation and take on all the troubles and the taxing weight of the world? Why did he then go through all the progression towards the cross and allow himself to be so dishonored? Why did he then take on our sin on the cross and endure the wrath of God? Why did he then go through the separation from God on the cross, bearing the weight of our sin, going into the tomb? Well, the reason is because he'd be resurrected. And then he would ascend, and he would stand before all of us and declare his victory, and then sit at the right hand of the Father and intercede for us. Jesus, Luke chapter 19, verse 10, came to seek and to save that which was lost. Well, those here this morning who know Christ as Lord and Savior can celebrate that, right? That Jesus Christ sought us, that he saved us, that he indwells us. And that the same forgiveness that came to Zacchaeus that day is the same forgiveness that we celebrate. And for those who may not know Christ as Lord and Savior, He's seeking you too. Your name is known by Him. And His desire is to be brought into relationship with you by you repenting of your sin and believing in Christ as Zacchaeus had done. Pray with me. Father, thank you for just this story that as we have said and recounted, it's a song that many of us know from our youth. But the drama of the story is so massive when we see how much hatred you endured to simply save one sinner. Lord, while the world works against your gospel, we know that you created this entire world and you control everything. And you draw us to yourself in salvation. We praise you for the work you did to transform Zacchaeus and for the joy of knowing you as Lord and Savior. We look forward to the day when we will see you face to face. But until then, may we be found faithful to tell others of your gospel. In your name, amen. We pray you've been edified by this presentation. You've been listening to the teaching ministry of Calvary Bible Church in Jolton, Tennessee. For more information on Calvary Bible Church or for more audio, please visit our website at cbctn.org.